there's so much about Jerry that um, intrigues me and the way his own story is refracted in his work. Um, his father being a sort of pillar of the story of baseball in the US and then his own, his own story with um, club culture and the way it's all come together. Now he's a sort of, he is an ambassador for what he calls American luxury. And in a few days, he's launching his new collection. The seven, it's called the seventh collection because he has stood outside the whole orthodox fashion system of seasons. He numbers his collections. And so instantly at this time when everybody is debating the, the rationale of, of showing seasonally, uh, especially because fashion is so ahead of itself on spring and fall and all these other um, crazy pre-fall and resort and all these other crazy definitions. Jerry, the seventh collection, what does that mean? Uh, man, it's um, for us as a team, um, obviously there's tons of, uh, you know, spiritual meaning behind the number seven, uh, completeness, wholeness, um, and, you know, as we talked a little bit offline about the, 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 the secret, the secretnicity of the times um, just so happens that we're in a position where we feel like our collection is a complete offering as well. And so for the first time, we're offering categories that we've, we haven't offered to date, which is uh, tailoring and suiting made in Italy, accessories, um, hand knits done in Italy. And so for us, it's a, it's a move from, uh, from an emerging brand to a foundational brand, this move into uh, perpetuity, this move into uh, um, just as much as it's our latest collection, I feel like it's our first collection. So you've got this like theme of completeness, but this beginning into perpetuity um, and, and being around forever, being able to withstand the waves of, uh, you know, a hype culture that we were born into but not necessarily of, um, and being able to withstand that and still, um, uh, I don't want to say write our own destiny, but, but, you know, stay in, stay in control of our narrative in a way that continues to be honest and transparent. How uh, influential was your collaboration with Alessandro Sartori at Xenia with this collection? Because obviously you're working with the finest that in the world Italian fashion has to offer. So uh, that must have been an incredible experience, I would imagine. Yeah, it was an incredible experience that, you know, um, just gave me the confidence that my perspective in this space uh, is valid. And, you know, what Alessandro and I worked on was, was a collection that um, kept in mind the Zania customer and also kept in mind the Fear of God customer. Um, what we're doing with Seventh Collection is uh, purely our point of view, um, and so um, uh, the, the the shoulder is as generous as we want it. The uh, the uh, nuances of the fits and the color palette are uh, not to say that what we did together was compromised, but what we did together was was directed for uh, a wider audience, so to speak. And so this is. Um, kind of my, un, I don't want to say, un, un, I guess, unfiltered uh, vision of tailoring and suiting. Um, he very but, impressed by, maybe he was very impressed by your volumes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, it's just, I, I, I have always referenced, you know, the late 80s and early 90s and um, uh, the volumes of those pieces and, and somehow, um, being able to speak sophistication and elegance and and comfortability at the same time um you know those are elements that we pour into a pair of sweatpants you know how does a sweatpant feel equally luxury as it does lived in you know and 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 the shape and the silhouette and the proportion and the touch and the feel and and it's, it's really um pouring all of the the, the dna of how we see fashion just into different categories. And once I kind of looked at it in that prism, I, I, I knew that it was something that I could, I, I could do. 
what what is it about the 80s and 90s uh, the late 80s and early 90s that grab you fashion wise because you do say that you don't have a fashion education and um you know the late 80s early 90s i think of that as a sort of height of the supermodel moment in fashion that was the height of fashion maximalism so what when i and when i look at your clothes maximalism isn't what strikes me there are the the volumes are generous but you you don't get excess i don't think so what is it about that time that particularly registers with you um if if i'm honest i mean i was uh you know going through junior high and high school at that time and i think as as people we're, we're the most um influenced during you know those youthful years of our lives you know and we're aspiring to be um you know the people that we see on the screen whether it's a denzel washington or michael jackson or uh george michael or you know tom cruise a young brad pitt you know all these guys that we're kind of looking up to and and, and aspiring to be and 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 you're obviously looking at how they're dressed and i think there was something about that time period that to me was the highest level of again effortlessness and sophistication and i'm sure your take on that time period is so far from mine you know be, you you being exposed to fashion shows and designers and i'm i'm being exposed to whatever i see on tv you know that was my that was my prism whatever i would see on tv or whatever i see in movies and and, and magazines and um and uh those are the things that i still pull from today but i think uh, what however how, however different our visions would have been because my vision was obviously it was different um what came out of fashion at that time was confidence and mm. optimism and enjoyment of clothes and you know we're in a period right now where all those things have been challenged um we're in we're in a situation that's so um difficult and so clouded and uh, how have you managed to put together the seventh collection with every spiritual register that the number seven has in such a difficult time? Um, I, I, I like to think that our company is founded on principles that allow us to move uh, gracefully through the times, whether that's through a pandemic, whether that's through social injustice, uh, we've always had an empathy and a compassion for people. Uh, we've always had a, um, a belief uh, in, in diversity and we've always um, operated in a way that we only put out collections when they're ready. And as, as a word, sustainability becomes a buzzword. I believe the way that we put out collections is, um, is, is a way that honors uh, sustainability. You know, we only, again, put out collection. Our last collection was two years ago. And so we're not putting out clothes just for the sake of putting out clothes. We're putting out clothes when we feel like we, number one, have something to say. Number two, that we have solutions for uh, what's missing uh, in the marketplace. Um, and so we don't feel as if we're um, operating from a place of uh, uh, a capitalistic spirit. We feel like we're proposing what's needed, you know, uh, regardless of what's happening. And I think um, because we've always been cognizant and um, um, kind of aware of what's happening, we're, we're able to kind of move, um, uh, I don't want to use the word gracefully, but we're able to move uh, uh, honestly and truthfully, you know, whether that's us creating a- Intelligently a uh, I mean, I, I hate to, to, to use, I mean, I, I think, you know, us, us really, you know, being, even being on collections, it was just me being ignorant to the fact that I needed to be on seasons to sell my collection to Barney's seven years ago. You know, I didn't know that I was just making what I felt was missing, you know? Um, and then because I'm self-taught, you know, it took me a year or two to get my second collection out, you know? And so, uh, there was an ignorance that also played into the way that we operate, you know, an ignorance to the system. Um, but I've always felt as, as, as long as our product is, is the best that it could be with the resources that we've been given, um, 
that our product would make room for us. Our product would make room for us on the on the on the sales floor. And I didn't I didn't I had more faith in 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 the pieces that we were making than in the fickle market that we play in. And as soon as I start to think about the market and what's happening and the trends that are happening, I, I get lost and I, I can't play that game. I have to just focus on um, what I feel like it is that God has given me to say. Well, you know, there's that saying that ignorance is bliss, um, which is, I, I mean, you just you, that was a great illustration of it right there. But presumably you are guided by what people tell you and what people say about what it is that they're missing or needing in their lives. Um, for seven, what were you feeling uh, from the fear of God customer? Uh, because presumably seven was created over the last stretch of time when we've gone from about two years the COVID epidemic, like a like a the pandemic, like a field that was then seeded by the Black Lives Matter movement. You've <laughs> had these two, these two, this this kind of incredible symbiosis of awakening in a way for, for mm -hmm. everybody, on good and bad. Yeah, I mean, in in all honesty, our seventh collection was pretty much done even before, you know. Uh, before, before COVID hit, we've been working on this for about two years. And I think the, the perception that I have isn't necessarily about my customer. It's selfishly more so about kind of what I'm looking for next. And as my point of view is um, uh, maturating or, or, or maturing and uh, as I'm growing and as a, you know, uh, a father now and wanting to go to a parent teacher meeting with my son and not looking like my son in the way that I'm dressed and, you know, wanting to have a, a blazer on or, or, or wanting to uh, present myself in a more sophisticated way. Um, I'm assuming and I'm betting that my customers feeling the same and is wanting the same. Um, and, um, you know, whether it's a, a pair of loafers that, you know, don't make me feel like I'm 50 or 60, but that still make me feel like I'm my age. I'm assuming my customer kind of wants the same thing, you know? And so I'm constantly kind of betting on myself, you know, every collection and um, using myself as my own research and development, you know, which is one of the reasons why we, you know, adding ignorance to it. But I, you know, as a, as a shopper going, you know, back, back in the day, going to Barney, it's like, I, it didn't matter what season it was. I just knew I wanted a coat, you know, yeah. or I just felt like I needed a new pair of jeans. Yeah. And so I, I didn't feel as if my customer was shopping that way. I just felt as if I provided him with the best possible solution for him that he would buy it no matter what time of year it was. And so, um, Yes, it's 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 a it's a, a, a scary place to be because I'm living in pres presumption, um, but the presumption is driven by a conviction that comes from a uh, uh, a deeply rooted place. It's it's highly unlikely that you were looking for a coat in the middle of summer, and that's where fashion had put everybody. You know, so I, I think the whole ration, rationalization that was. <laughs> where you can go you, from now on, hopefully, you'll be able to go to Barney's when it's getting cold and you need a coat and you will actually see a coat instead of a rack of bathing suits, which is where, you know, fashion had gone. But I'm, I'm, I'm wondering that you said that you said you've been working on Seven for two years. It's been this evolution, but how, um, I, I look at the collection and I'm thinking, You've incorporated the Negro League sweatshirt. You've, you've got gray sweatshirt and um, the grays, the Homestead grays were one of the most famous teams in the, in, the, in the Negro Leagues. And that feels to me like such a timely recognition of uh, black culture. Uh, maybe it's a bit of black culture that people don't know about. Um, I mean, I, I don't know very much about baseball, but after I was looking at your... At the, at, the, at the pictures of the collection, I went and looked, at, I read about the Negro Leagues and I read about that incredible story that I imagine mm -hmm. a lot of people don't know about and the incredible personalities and so on. It just felt that that was a very timely 
insertion in seven, that a sort of consciousness raising moment. Um, are you saying that you'd actually, you were already doing that or that? Yeah, we were, yeah, we were, um, you know, as we kind of talked a little bit offline, you know, we were playing with all these graphics from like the late eighties and early nineties, you know, again, whether it was like a comic relief t-shirt with Billy Crystal or, you know, Robin Williams underneath a blazer or Denzel with a Negro League sweatshirt underneath a blazer. And we were using all these different graphics to just kind of find the, find the vibe of the collection. Um, and then, and this Negro League graphic is one that, that stuck, that, that, that stuck and uh, stuck. And um, as time went on, I found out that it was indeed the hundredth year anniversary of the league. And um, uh, it, it was just one of those godly timing things that happened. And once I found that out, we just really went deeper. You know, we really went deeper and we, you know, we um, played on, on, on a lot of the, what I felt was like some of the most sophisticated artwork that felt very Ivy League, like Yale, you mm -hmm. know, the beautiful, just big, you know, Gray's G and the mm -hmm. simple G, G on the hat that if you don't know it's Negro League, it speaks to American history, just purely on the placements and the, and the uh, application of it, you know, the flocking and the soft way that the, the, the artwork was applied. And so, um, really wanting to celebrate the Negro Leagues. Uh, my grandfather, Lorenzo Manuel, pitched in the Negro Leagues. My, my dad, Jerry Manuel, uh, managed in the big leagues uh, for the Sh Chicago White Sox and the New York Mets. Um, and the reality is like Fear of God is a, uh, is a product of the Negro Leagues. Our, my, my brand is a product of those men who arguably were the best in the world and not given a chance to play yeah. on the greatest stage in the world. Yeah. Um, one, of the, one of the facts about the Negro Leagues that I love is as soon as the color barrier was broken, um, the next seven MVPs in Major League Baseball were all African-American. So it goes to show you how great that they were. And I just think about uh, the pain of being the best at something and not being able to compete. The pain of being the best in the world and you know you're the best in the world, but you're not given the platform. And so now that I have this platform, um, I have to honor the past. I have to honor those that weren't recognized. And I have to be an example of kind of where we can go. And so, um, you know, I'm not only standing on their shoulders, but at the same time, you know, trying to lift them up with whatever whatever platform this is that I have through through fashion that I I never thought I'd be doing, but but I'm here. Well, you talk about that Jackie Robinson, you know, being the kind of the hero, and then building a bridge back to the people who made Jackie Robinson possible. And you know, people talk about fashion being a mirror, but the idea of it being a bridge is really interesting as well. I mean, do you feel? that in your work you have you actually have a you, you talked about a platform but also a responsibility that that people listen to you you know there's a lot of there's a lot of people who would listen to you ahead of many other voices who are spouting their opinions and where does that where does that place you do you think how do you how do you feel about that given that you said you're self-educated um, a lot of designers don't think about, you know, the power of their voice. But well, my for me, it's you know, it's what separates me from from most designers. It's not how good I am at what I do, or it's why I do what I do. I I, I know the why. I'm I'm convicted of why I'm doing what I'm doing, and that frees me up beyond beyond the the beyond the product, you know? I, I know that there's something, there's a bigger story to be told. And I, and I, and I think, you know, you know I, I, I listen to uh, uh, Bishop T.D. Jakes every morning and he's, you know, one of the things he says, it's not how well you fight, it's what you're fighting for. And I know what I'm fighting for. I'm clear on that, clear as day. And so I, I'm, I'm, that allows me to operate in a space 
uh, with a different level of freedom because my, how I'm judged in this space isn't necessarily determined by the space. It's determined by why I'm doing what I'm doing and how I'm helping and providing um, an example uh, for other people to do what it is that they're called to do. You know, I've said it before, like the, the last thing I want to do is inspire the next designer. You know, I want to inspire a young kid that doesn't have access to resources to be the, to be the greatest architect that he could be. You know, I want to inspire, inspire the next kid to be the best athlete he could be, the best doctor he could be. Um, for me, what I'm doing isn't necessarily about fashion. And I've realized that I'm, I'm good enough at it that if given the, the, the right resources that I can tell a story that can be impactful enough to, uh, to inspire people. And that's, and that's what we're trying to do. So you're fighting for the freedom for people to be anything they want to be. Yeah, it, I'm, I'm fighting for the freedom for people to be what they want to be. And even in our clothing, you know, I'm fighting for our customer to be able to speak luxury and sophistication and still wear a proportion and a shape that is for them. And, and in a way, trying to free my customer up, you know, so, so many times uh, in order to say luxury, you step outside of a proportion or a shape that's really fit for you. And you put on maybe a suit that's maybe, you know, you're obviously dressed up or you're, you know, obviously wearing designer. How can you wear designer or speak elegance and still feel like you're wearing a hoodie and sweatpants and still be the person that you are? And so I'm fighting for that freedom as well. So your challenge is reconciling the hoodie and sweatpants with this kind of slightly elitist notion of sophistication then. You talk about sophistication, but you think sophistication can exist in a hoodie as much as it can exist in a immaculately tailored kind of Italian suit. A thousand percent. And that's why we've been, you know, proposing our, what we're doing as American luxury. You know, I, th I, think, I think the perfect shape and the perfect fitting hoodie can stand out in the same way that a perfect tailored blazer can, you know, if, if, if the proportions are right, you know, and it's these contemplated considered shapes that we stress over that are not just oversized, you know, every element, and, you know, from a volume of a, the carroting and volume of a sleeve and, uh, you know, where it falls on your waist and, you know, uh, how dense the fabric is to maintain its shape. And, you know, some people chalk it up as just a hoodie and that, that's okay. But we, we understand that, you know, we understand that we're providing the solution for the lifestyle that today is the modern man, that that is a California lifestyle that, uh, requires you to move in and out of different circumstances and um and and different uh uh different situations throughout the day whether you have a lunch meeting or you want to go to the gym or you want to you know come back to the office how are you how are you elegant and in, in in every uh in every situation and we and we think there's a solution for that when you say california how important has as the fact that you're based in los angeles been because you know, when I think about Los Angeles designers, two people come to mind for me, and that's um, Rudy Gernrich and Rick Owens. And both of them, in their own ways, define the notion of the outsider in fashion. You know, an entirely individual aesthetic, which evolves outside whatever else is happening in the world, in the world of fashion. Do you feel the same way about what you do then? That, that actually LA has offered you this freedom to, to do collection seven instead of this is my fall collection. This is, you know, you, you can evolve at your own speed with your own ethos, you know? Uh, I haven't thought of it that way. And, that, and that's, I, I've always argued like, hey, LA isn't slower than New York. It's just a different pace we're still getting to the same place. We're just moving differently. Um, but if you look at the pace and in that sense, then yes, that's also informed it, but even more so um, it's one of the, 
one of the biggest cities in the world that's full of people with different jobs that aren't necessarily nine to fives, you know, and, 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 and the lifestyle of LA requires a different, a different wardrobe. You know, it's got, it's got to be a little bit more, you know, it's got to have a little bit more freedom in it. You've got to be able to do, you know, some different things, you know? And so I, I, it's, it's the pace, as you mentioned, and it's, it's also the lifestyle that have, uh, and really informed our, our, our point of view. And it's this, you know, uh, it's the city that you try super hard to look like you're not trying, <laughs> you know, and us just like constantly kind of chasing that is, um, you know, one of the things, again, that's uh, and, and, and formed our point of view. I wouldn't say it's pace uh, that, that, that I'm talking about. I would say it's otherness. You know, it's outsider. It's, it's a sort of real outsider status in fashion. Um, you know, I, I mentioned to you before we went live that um, I, was looking at, I was looking at Seven and I was thinking when Margiela went to, when Martin Margiela went to Hermes and offered this version of luxurious ease that was kind of controversial because it was so stripped back. And now it is so utterly desirable, however many decades later, that sort of timeless outsiderness, you know? Hmm. And, and, and the, the volume of what you offer, um, you, there's a hoodie and there's a, there's a track pant, but there, there, there are these coats that are just, you know, clutch coats or wrap coats, or there's just a sense of something that's, very divorced from whatever else other people might be thinking about in fashion, because it's based in a different kind of consideration. You know, um, I think that's kind of, that's what's strong about fear of God. It just doesn't feel like other stuff. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I mean, I, I think it's, you know, in, in order to influence something, you can't be so wrapped up in it. You know, you have to be, you have to have this otherness. You have to be outside of it to bring something to the table, to bring a, a fresh point of view. You have to kind of stand outside of, of what's happening. And I think you, 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 a, a lot of brands are starting to borrow and look so much like each other because they're consuming everything and they're, and they're, whether they know it or not, they're, they're downloading each other's ideas constantly. And I think one of the things for me that's been important practice is just tapping out, you know, it's just not really, not really under, not really being too concerned about what's happening right now. What, what, what we're creating, I feel like could have came out five or 10 years ago, could have come out mm -hmm. five or 10 years from now and, and, or and still be relevant. Ago, or 30 years ago, you know, and still, yeah, still look relevant. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we're, as we enter this, you know, this new uh, space of perpetuity, we want the garments to, to, to speak the same, you know, these enduring, these time enduring shapes and, and, and ideas that um, will stand the test of time. And I think that's kind of what our focus is on. It's not necessarily focusing on trend or what's happening right now. It's how are we laying the foundations uh, through our product that enable us to be here um, for a long time to come. When you think about American luxury, have you looked, have you explored that idea through, um, in the, uh, through history, uh, through the history of American fashion? Have you looked at people like, you know, Zoran or Norman Norell or Claire McArdle, just people who had the same kind of hoodie? I probably should. I, I probably no, looked I at it and didn't really realize I was. I mean, I, I think I, I always look at Ralph. I always look at Ralph. I mean, um, you know, my wife and I watched the documentary and she, you know, just couldn't believe how much of the way he saw the world is in the way that I see the world, you yeah. know, even from the, from the way that, you know, all of my references come from movies that I watched as a kid, mm -hmm. you know, and, 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 and the, um, and where my imagination would go from those movies, you know, and, and, and recreating those emotions. And you have to tell me what really, movies. You have to tell me what movies. 
I mean, they they could. I mean, any anything late eighties, early nineties, from Breakfast Club to License to Drive. I mean, it, it could be really bad movies. I think Pelican Brief is like a great like. I love the I love the palette in Pelican Brief with Julia Roberts and Denzel, like the suiting and like you know just any anything around that time is you know. I drive my wife crazy. I just watch movies and press pause all day and screenshots and oh, I love that Rodneck. You know, it's Rocky Four uh, press conference and he's got like this melange Donegal like blazer. I'm like, yes, that's what I'm looking for. You know, so I'm I'm just always looking back at at those films that I was kind of aspiring to as a kid when I was little. I'm still recovering from when you told me when you're working with Alessandro Sartori that Twins was one of your big movies with Arnold Schwarzenegger <laughs> and Danny DeVito. I had to put that one in the back of my mind for a little while. But I get it. I get, I get that. Um, I get that. But also it's interesting how instinctive, maybe just instinctive DNA is. Well, it is. It is instinctive. Of course it is. But there is a DNA that runs through American luxury to what you're doing. And um, I'm kind of glad in a way that you're not kind of sitting looking at books and thinking, oh yes, this is like a Claire McArdle moment or whatever, because, um, you know. It's, I, I, and I, it's I think that's idea. what, I think that's what allows me to, to have what I think is an honest point of view, you know, and if it happens to look like something else and it is what it is, you know, we're all kind of exposed to some of the same things, but um, I, I, I try to continue to be inspired, um, from an authentic place of, you know, in, in speaking back to the Negro leagues, you know, not only did my grandfather play in the Negro leagues, but, you know, growing up in, in my house, you know, my mom had so much Negro league art and artifacts and memorabilia. And it was just a part of my childhood, you know, it was a part of who I am and I can, I can speak to that and celebrate that and um, in a way that whether the world is doing it right now or not, it, it comes from such a, such more of a deeper place for me that I know that, that those around me that know me best are, are, are proud of, of what I'm proposing and I'm proud of what I'm doing with this, with this platform that I've been given. Do you feel now more than ever that uh, it's time for fashion to have a political spine um you know that uh, it's interesting that that you 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 quote bishop td jakes and and he did say that the greatest gift you can give someone is exposure and the notion of having the platform where you can you know fashion doesn't engage with politics in a real, sometimes it does, but not, not always, doesn't engage with politics in a really kind of gut way. But do you feel now um, in this election year that you need to? Kamala Harris has just been picked as a VP. Um, yeah, I'm so excited about that. I mean, she's uh, she went to a, uh, graduated from a historically black uh, college and university in Howard. I graduated from Florida a and which is a black college. Um, and I, I'm just so happy to see the black woman, you know, throughout humanity, you know, has always, you know, always been overlooked. And I think it's such a powerful time now um, uh, with her in this, in this, in this role. Um, that really speaks to the change that's that's necessary within society, that we can begin to look at each other as equals and begin to uh, look at each other and respect the uh, respect our gifts despite you know our complexion, despite our background. You know, we're, we we've all been given God given gifts, and I think um, I think now as important as it may seem, it's always been this important. You know, the, 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 the noise is just a lot louder, but the, the, the cry for equality is, has always been there, you know? And I don't, 
I don't know what fashion's responsibility is. I know what my responsibility is. You know, I, I, I don't, I don't have the, the bandwidth to, to, to consider fashion in that way. I know what the calling on my life is and I know what, what I'm here to do. And that's, that's kind of what I'm focused on, you know, and I think it's hard for fashion brands and companies that haven't always practiced, um, whether it's diversity or inclusion to now speak on that, if that hasn't been what they're about. And I feel like, I feel like it's a heart thing first, you know, is it something that you believe in and it's something that, um, um, that is a principle in your life. I think that becomes something that you can build on. Um, but it's not something that can be built on based on a, um, a PR strategy. Yes, if it's not, exactly. if it's not what you believe in. No, exactly. Yeah. And, it, and it just, you know, those, those type of things need to be practiced internally before they're spoken about externally, you know? And so, I mean, we're in a moment where, um, where, we're facing a, a, a dark time, a, a, the uncertainty that, that's confronting us on every level, socially, economically, medically, I, I mean, politically, is, is, is so huge that I'm really, I'm curious to see, I'm, well, I'm more than curious to see how fashion adjusts to this, because fashion, speak so immediately to so many people and what what does fashion need to be saying or doing right now what do you think again tim i i, I just kind of know what i need to say and what is you know that? and i and i yeah to celebrate 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 the marginalized celebrate the overlooked you know and I, I need to fight to 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 have an opinion at the highest level so that the kids coming up behind me feel like they're valid enough to do the same thing you know and I, I think some kids just don't have the example of someone that looks like them in certain positions and without that visual example sometimes it, it feels impossible you know, it was just like Barack Obama becoming president. You know, I didn't, my mom and dad always say, hey, you could be anything you want. I was like, yeah, but I can't be president. You know, <laughs> I could be anything I want, but I can't be that, you know? And then he becomes president and it like breaks these mental barriers in your head of what's possible. And so I'm just trying to like break the mental barriers in, in the minds of, of our following of what's possible, what they can do with their lives, what they can do with, with their God-given gifts, fashion just happens to be the platform that I'm that I'm using to do that. Um, you know, my dad was able to do that before me. Uh, becoming a manager in Major League Baseball uh, was wasn't long before him, where it was thought that you know blacks could play at a high level but didn't have the mental intelligence to manage or coach and strategize. Uh, so he was an example of being able to do that, and so. Um, even though what I'm doing is not in sports or in baseball, it's, it's, it's standing on the shoulders of, you know, the people be, before me that have, you know, broken the barriers of, 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 of what's possible and what people are, are capable of doing. So would, would you say, getting back to the point I was making before about the outsider, the outsiderness, you know, not just being the, the designer in LA, but, uh, would you say that you feel yourself, you, you see yourself as the voice of the outsider in a way in fashion? I don't know if I'm the voice of the outsider, but I do feel like I'm an outsider in the sense that, um, you know, I'm never comfortable during fashion week. You know, I, I love to go to, you know, you know, my, my, my friend shows or, you know, and, 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 you know, whether it's Virgil or, or, heron or whoever that's that's showing um but i just never feel like i fit and so and i've gotten to a place where i'm okay with that and i don't need to fit within fashion to be validated you know it's just kind of and so i know that i'm 
outside, but I feel like my strength is that I'm outside. My strength is that I see it differently. And to go back to TD Jakes, the, the, the reason that you know you can do something is that you see it differently. And I feel a power that I can do this because I know that I see it in a way that only I see it. And that gives me the conviction to, to continue to, to keep doing uh, to keep doing this. So you, you, you validate yourself in a way, you think, that um, when you talk about what validates you, you feel that you validate yourself. That, that uh, by kind of honoring your own, by, uh, by bringing your own convictions into like physical life. Form. Yeah, exactly. Physical yeah. Life. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm, you know, fear of God, uh, calling, calling your, your, your brand fear of God. It always intrigued me because <laughs> um, I, at this point, I'd be so happy if you renamed it Wrath of God and just <laughs> you know, went for it, like because because righteous anger feels to me like the response that just about every sane individual needs to feel right now. So I, I wonder how I you stay it, optimistic. I mean, it, it is wrath of God. It, it, it is that gangster. That's why I love the name Fear of God when 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 I landed on it, because you know, on one hand, it's a, if you don't know God, there's a fear of him. If you're uh, in relationship with him, there's a reverence and a respect. It's a different type of fear of God. Um, and so I, I like that wrath, that gangsterness about it, that that demands a level of, of reverence and demands a level of respect. And I think, uh, yeah, we, we are in a time where um, it almost feels like we are feeling the wrath. You know, we're feeling the wrath of, uh, of how we talked about it, how this country was founded, you know what I mean? And we're, 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 we're feeling the backlash of that and the wrath of that. And, you know, uh, you know, Jesus went in and turned over tables. He got upset, you know, it's, it's, it's okay, you know, and, 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 and we've got to, uh, we've got to listen to, um, we, you know, everyone was looking for 2020, Oh, it's going to be the year of perfect vision, 2020 vision. Mm. And I feel like these, we've been hit with uh, some very heavy things that opened our eyes up. And it, we, it, it's our responsibility now to, to, to really take a pause and like, you know, have a new perspective, have a new perspective. And do you have an idea of what that would be? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, again, I think it's the same thing that we, we, we touched on before from inclusivity to empathy, to compassion for others, a completely new yeah. fashion world. Yeah. A, a, a fashion world that's based on solution and based on inspiration, you know, I mean, I, you know, it, it's, that, that's based on inspiring people or providing, you know, solutions for people, not necessarily based on commerce or, and, and trend, but hey, I'm, I'm providing a, whether it's a beautiful piece of art that just makes someone feel, feel good or a, a coat that they needed, you know, those are to me are the responsibilities of, you know, um, the people that sit in similar positions uh, that, that I am. I'm eternally hoping for some kind of revolution. You know, if Jesus walked into an evangelical church right now, he'd, he'd be doing a lot more than turning over tables, I think. So, um, well, I, I feel like, hey, I feel like the church is, is, is getting exposed. You know, I feel like the church is getting exposed as a part of this, you know, um, and we'll, 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 we'll see what churches fill back up after COVID and what churches don't. A new you faith. Know, and, yeah. Well, same, the um, same, the same, the same faith, just based on what the faith was supposed to be about, not our interpretation of what we, we thought it was about or our interpretation and using that for our own benefit. But well, you honestly, know what heading, yeah, what we're heading towards is, is I, I hope a new humanity. I, I feel that that how, you know, we need a new relationship with nature. So that's a new humanity right there. Um, 
I just feel, I don't know what I feel. I don't know. I, I don't, I feel, I don't feel optimistic. I just feel a little bit guarded. Really? I feel optimistic. You. Do you? I feel, yeah, I feel good, man. I, I feel super Infusing. optimistic. I, well, I just feel like all this had to happen in order for us to get to yes. a better place. Yeah. You I know, agree. we all, we, we all, we all agree with, with where we're going and as heavy as it is, you know, change always is, is, isn't easy, you know, but I think this had to happen in order for us to have the 2020 vision that we wanted, you know, so, uh, we'll get our 2020 vision in 2021, hopefully. So, yeah. And, and we have seven to look forward to as well. So, yeah, I'm excited about that. Thank and you, I'm, Jerry. Thank you, man. I'm it's super humbled to, to, uh, to speak with you and glad that, you know, I've uh, got a chance to meet you uh, last year and develop a relationship with you. I've always uh, looked up to you from afar. And so I just thank you for taking the time, man. It means a lot to me. I, I appreciate it. Well, thank you. It's been uh, wonderful talking to you. We'll see you very soon, I hope.